Hello? from women involved in the Black Lives Movement and to also be able to ask questions that you have um, so that we can all continue to listen, to learn and to increase our understanding. Here at the Girls Network we believe that no girl's future should be limited by their gender, background or the colour of their skin and so we're excited to hear from Mo, Sasha and if you can join us also Lavinia to learn more about how we can support the movement. Um, Krishna mentioned already, but we wanted to create a professional and safe space for you all today. So we've switched off microphones and videos just to ensure we can do that. Um, but during the session, if you wish to ask or answer any questions, um, please use the chat box um, to the Girls Network. You should be able to see you can send a message to the Girls Network. Um, and um, those questions in particular will have a couple of opportunities to put them to our panelists um, and we'd like you to prioritize questions that will help you increase your knowledge and your understanding because that's really the purpose um, for us today and I've just seen Lavinia has joined us as well so welcome pleased to have you here so perfect timing um, I'm really excited to introduce you all to our three speakers and I'll give you a very brief intro to them but then I will hand over to them to tell you a little bit more about themselves um, so first of all, we have Mo, who is a long time, stand, long time standing mentor in Brighton. Um, she also recently set up Watch This Space, a diversity and inclusion consultancy working with businesses to make their organisations more inclusive. Second, we've just been joined by Lavinia. Lavinia Stennett is the Girls Network ambassador who in 2019 founded the Black Curriculum, which is a social enterprise working to teach and support the teaching of black history all year round. And finally, we have Sasha, who is also an ambassador of the Girls Network and was the first black female students union president at Kent University, which is one of the biggest charities in the UK also. So they'll tell you a little bit more about themselves. Um, and I'm going to start off by handing over um, to Mo to kick us off. So if you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and also what the Black Lives Movement means to you. Sure. Hi, everybody. Great to see you all. I'm Mo and um, I'm a mentor for the Girls Network. So I work in, well, after for many years, I've worked in sales. So selling technology to businesses. I've done that for years, all kinds of strange things like widgets that go in space, things that go in radiotherapy machines, all kinds of software. Did that for years and years and years. And then last year decided that I wanted to stop working um, for a company and become a consultant. So I've been doing that since last year. And then and during lockdown, um, launched a diversity and inclusion consultancy with a couple of friends. And we're called Watch This Space. And we're all about helping businesses to address the gaps in their organization. So that could be around having more women in the company. It could be around having more people of color. It could be around how they think about their workspaces to be inclusive with people with different types of disabilities. It's about how they actually do their work as well, thinking about different ways to do that to be much more inclusive and we've launched a podcast as well if you're interested go to um, watchthisspace.uk and there's links to our podcast as well and that's all about conversations about how businesses can be more inclusive to have more diverse voices in the conversations that go on and in the roles that develop as well so that people can progress to different roles. Um, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, so I've been kind of following it since about 2013 when it started. So I've seen what it's about and it's a particular movement in response to police brutality. So I knew about it and I've seen what's been going on. And this movement has just grown and grown and grown. And during this time, what we've seen is it growing into something so much bigger. It's become a worldwide conversation about injustice in the world and about all the things that need to be addressed in society and it's been huge to see it happening um, it's been amazing to see it happening i'm a child of immigrants from india which is one perspective on this conversation but my parents faced you know a lot of difficult times when they came to england 
I faced some myself too, but nothing like they faced. Um, and it's kind of, it feels like for the first time ever, this is a moment where voices are being heard, things are changing and, and I just hope that continues and this really is a moment of change. Thank you, Mo. Um, so that you've got a really interesting, interesting perspective as well, having the business angle um, through your work as well as um, the other things that you do. That's great to hear. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Lavinia to tell us a little bit more about you um, and also your involvement and in what the Black Lives Movement means to you. Hi everyone, thanks Charlie. Um, so I'm Lavinia, I'm the founding director of the Black Curriculum, which essentially is a initiative that works to teach black history in schools all year round and not just in Black History Month, like as we all know, like Black History Month is in October and that's just the one time that you'd get taught. Um, black history in any form um, if you're lucky so we are working with schools and also young people directly to basically provide that learning but we also train teachers as well so that they can better equip themselves to, to be able to teach it in their classrooms all year round as well so um, that's something that I've been running for a year um, and I think with Black Lives Matter I think the work that we're doing is so intricately connected um, from a place of recognizing the humanity of black people, understanding that you know our value and our contributions to this society and our societies around the globe um, matter. And, and it's not just in death that we matter, it's in, um, in life and whilst we're um, active and living. So I think um, for me, it's really powerful to be able to kind of um, have the black curriculum recognized in this space, in this time, um, when Black Lives Matter has come to, I guess, like traction again and picked up more traction um but i think it's always important to just recognize that yeah black lives matter 365 days of the year not just when they're dying or october so to me it's really really important thank you lavinia and you said you um set this up uh, a year ago i'd love to know sort of what was the the prompt what was it that made you write this the time is now i've got to do this yeah i think it was when i was in new zealand so i'd done a study abroad as part of my degree and um, whilst I was studying Maori history, which are the indigenous people of New Zealand, I think to me it just connected that there's so many parallels between our experiences here as black people in Britain, as people who came from the British Empire, and even before that came from Africa, we had a culture um, that was essentially ripped away from us through colonialism. And I think seeing those two kind of situations face to face with my experience and also what people were telling me, I was like, this is really real. Um, and I came back to the UK just feeling like, um, it, it was just enough you know like there are people younger than me saying the same thing people older than me saying the same thing and it's just like this is just too much now so we actually have to make a change yeah well good for you for seeing it and actually doing something because often people see it and don't take action so it's yeah. great that you did um thank you and so passing finally to sasha um, again it'd be lovely to hear a little bit more about you and your involvement with us and then also what the black lives movement means to you yeah sure thank you very much um, so I'm Sasha Langevald. I'm a graduate from the University of Kent. So I graduated in 2018 um, and then I ran in the leadership elections and was elected as a vice president for the Students Union and then president um, in the last academic year. So I've just finished my, my role actually. I think it was on a Friday. So officially today I'm, I'm free <laughs> in some ways. Um, and I guess my journey with the Girls Network started when I was um, a mentee. Um, and the, the network came to my school and I remember a lot of, you know, girls jumping at the opportunity um, and I've stayed in contact um, since um, and had great opportunities since then. So, you know, Girls Network is a quite a big part of my life. Um, so I'm a philosophy graduate um, and I guess that's enough about me. <laughs> um, but what the movement means to me, I guess it's, it's what the other panelists have said. I think it's about real change now. I think we've gone a long time with just seeing countless and countless of you know black people dying at the hands of police brutality and just in general in the world and i think right now is the time where de facto and de jure change is actually meeting in in quite um i would say a forceful change um and it's more societal i think people are starting to realize that one day i think the light bulb just switched in their head and they started to realize that they need to have a voice at this table and black people you know you don't need to tell black people that their lives matter because they they fight for that every day it's everyone who is around that needs to understand 
the, the difference between, for example, black um, as well as people of color. Um, and it's also, you know, the responsibility of everybody who is non-black to have a voice to to start engaging these in, in these uncomfortable conversations. And the point is they're supposed to be uncomfortable because nobody's gonna wanna you know identify their privilege um, in in an easy way. And that's it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's going to lead to change. So I think that's what's really important. And in in me, um, you know, I've been given a role in my leadership position. So it's so important for me to use my voice for the right things. And in my job, I've been frustrated um, because, you know, my fellow teammates who are, for example, white, they haven't used their voice in the right way. And, and it frustrates me because they have such a big platform. So about reaching to people who have a platform and, and getting to them to acknowledge the power that they have. Um, and, you know, in the last couple of weeks, we took to the streets of Canterbury and we were just chanting down the road. So I think, you know, like my friend says, a lot of pressure makes diamonds. So we just need to keep going with what this movement is um, and keep going until literally we get the, the same amount of um, rights as everybody else. Thank you, Sasha. And I really like what you say about it being an uncomfortable conversation and that's really important and we have to stay with that discomfort because that's where the important conversations happen right um thank you so um my second question to you all is obviously this has been a period of learning for everybody and we're starting from different points of view different understandings different levels of experience um but i'd love it if you could share with us um something new that you've learned during this period um or perhaps somebody new and inspiring that you've been influenced um by over um the last few uh weeks or so um i'll start with you lavinia because i need to leave us sooner um can you tell us a little bit about that please yeah so um over the last couple of weeks i've observed with everyone else how um yeah first of all i think it's really important to acknowledge that we've been in a period of grieving for like the last three months with COVID and like everyone dying and like, you know, parts of my family were in hospitals. I think just being at home and isolated and away from my friends and having this kind of traumatic information constantly, like just on repeat, it's definitely like made a lot of people just, um, I guess, understand the, the importance of life and I guess mortality as well. Um, and I think, with obviously the death of George Floyd um, and seeing such a, a like a horrific killing on camera, for me what it's it's shown is that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of ways in which we just are unaware, and I think living our lives um, having to kind of go to point A to point B, um, just just always kind of just being on the go and never really thinking to just sit back and reflect, we miss um, the really important parts of um, how I guess society functions, and I think during this time what I've been able to see is um, I guess a collective kind of consciousness. And I know it sounds really airy fray, but I think everyone right now is on the same kind of like wavelength in how they're thinking, how they're seeing society. And I don't think if coronavirus had never happened, we would be here. I do think it was a backdrop um, that has allowed us to kind of get here and be more unified and, and take this more seriously as, as a society. So I think on a positive note out of this, um, I'm definitely seeing that everyone is a lot more kind of like it feels different and I feel like a lot of people are more yeah connected in how they're thinking about this as an issue that's, that's structural so I think that's a positive thing because from there we can now start to work towards um, creating change and I've seen a lot of people just say like posting a black box on Instagram is not enough let's do more let's do this let's do that and support existing initiatives that are there so I think it's a positive thing um, and that's yeah I guess my observation from the, the last say four months yeah Thank you. I think that's a really important point, the necessity of people being together and collective and the strength in working together and talking and sharing. So that's a really helpful reflection. Thank you. Um, Mo, I'll hand over to you in a second um, to ask you the same thing. Uh, just to remind everyone listening um, that we really want this to be a conversation, an opportunity for you to learn as well from our panellists and their experiences. So once I've taken answers from Mo and Sasha on this, we'll have our first opportunity for you to ask some questions um, so that this is a really good learning experience for you. So please do, if you have a question, um, send it in the chat channel to the Girls Network um, and that will get fed through to our panellists. Um, so over to you Mo, tell us what you've learned over this period. 
Yeah, so I'm um, someone who's always been interested in history and facts anyway. So I knew a lot of the history of the, the kind of real history of the British Empire, partly from the perspective of India with my family, but also more generally, it's something I've always been interested in and read around. So I've been reading more facts around that and um, absorbing more, but it's actually led me to look more at structures in British society and how they cause the injustice just by the very structures. So a lot of my family work in the National Health Service. So I'm, I've been painfully aware of all of the deaths of people of colour right from when this started. And it's when you start to unpick all of the structural things that get us to this point that I've found fascinating. So I've absorbed things like the National Health Service has a high percentage of people of colour. So that's black people as well as a lot of um, other races as well are working in the NHS, really high percentages. Yet when you get to the senior levels of the NHS, the people at the top, they're all white. And that goes a long way to explaining why there are issues and why there are injustices in the system. So I've been absorbing a lot of that and really learning about a lot of that to help my understanding. And it surprised me how much people I know, I'm, I'm older than the other two panelists, so it surprised me how much people of my generation just don't know a lot of those things and don't know anything about it. And I've had to do a lot of, I don't know if you've had to do the same, but a lot of educating of people, telling them things to read. It's been quite exhausting in lots of ways because it's like, you know, actually people can find some of this stuff out for themselves as well, but there've been like lots of questions and lots of discussions going on. And so actually I would say, one of the people that's really inspired me is kind of away from facts almost i i'm a reader as well and i've loved um i don't know if you people have read girl woman other by bernardine avaristo um i had already read the book but i reread it and i've seen her talking a lot during this debate she's been on she's been on the airwaves, she's been writing, she's been doing lots of things, and I found her really inspiring. Her way of talking about this has really like been interesting and inspiring. If you haven't read the book, I really recommend it. Not just that book, actually. Her writing is generally really worth reading. Thanks, Mo. Um, what is it about her writing that, that makes it so captivating? Can you sort of put your finger on why you find it so... Um, yes, if we talk about Girl, Woman, Other, that's probably the book that's been talked about the most. It's 12 different stories that are linked and they do show um, themes, but they're very accessible. So if anybody wants to read it, there's there's a story there that will resonate with people somewhere along the line. And it's the way she writes like that that captures people, I think. Mm. I guess it shows the power of storytelling, actually. And if you've got a yeah. character you can relate to, suddenly something that might feel abstract come, becomes more alive. And you yeah. can begin to relate to something that otherwise might have felt a bit remote and, and inaccessible. Definitely, um, yeah. Great recommendation, thank you. Um, so Sasha, I'll hand over to you now. Um, where have you found inspiration? What have you learned over this period of time? Um, I think I've learned a lot of things. I would say statistics are some of the things that I've just now ingrained in my mind. So I'm ready to fight any racist that tries to defend anything <laughs> that's not right. Um, but I, I guess what I've learned more is literally, I guess it's more about gaining, gaining yourself, your confidence in yourself and, and knowing when to pick your battles. The whole thing is exhausting for, for a lot of black people and a lot of my friends, for example, we were up most of the night just messaging like, oh, did you see this other post that happened and, and this other thing that happened? So I think for me, it's, it's about also choosing which battles that I would want to fight and where I can put my, most, my energy most in and what change that I can get out of that. Um, but I think like what um, Lavinia said, I think it's with everyone gaining more consciousness about this in general, it gives, I would say, black people more confidence and in calling out things in the workplace. For example, in my workplace, there's a lot of microaggressions and you know, previously I wouldn't say anything because I, I would just brush it off because, you know, we're in COVID-19, we're in emergency crisis era. Um, but I kept seeing things online and people kept saying, you know, it's, it's correct. You are in the right to be calling out these things when you, for example, being called aggressive at work for doing something that everyone else would. Um, and it gave me the confidence to, you know, challenge the senior leaders in, in my organization to say, you know, I, I'm not comfortable with you saying this to me. Um, and I think it's also gained more people awareness on how 
you know, people are not one dimensional when they talk about race, because if you look at the world, like nobody's equal. And I think once we get to equality, um, then people can possibly even use that. But it, it's still not an, a good enough argument to say that, you know, why are you always talking about race? And I think, you know, that that is actually one of the criticisms that I got in one of my strengths and developments. And that was at the beginning of the year. Um, and when I look at how, you know, the world is changing now, I think people have just realized what what it actually means that people need to actually have an act be an actual like an active ally and i think that's what people have learned more so in the last couple of weeks what i've learned to myself is more about also challenging the the uncomfortableness when it comes to me as a person because i am black i'm proud to be black but if you look at my skin i'm i'm socially acceptable to to the white society um and how i need to learn as well and i think other you know light-skinned people need to learn how society treats other different colored black people so for example dark-skinned women are not given the, the same advantages um as light-skinned women and i think we need this conversation to be happening in uh in in the world and in, in organizations so i think that's what i've more so tried to teach myself and i've had many identity crises in the last couple of weeks. Um, I know loads of people are saying, you're not black. And I'm like, but I am black. I'm proud to be black. My skin might be light and I need to accept the, the privileges that come with that. But you know, I'm proud to be black and I'll always be black. Um, so there's a lot of hurdles I think that need to come along the way, um, especially talking to my family. Um, I know I've had quite a few battles of my own in the last couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, so that, that's more so that I've learned. And I think we just need to keep having these uncomfortable conversations and empowering, especially black young women to, to have a voice and, and to use it. Because I feel like a lot of people uh, change that they weigh, the way that they are when they're in the work environment to be accepted, to be, you know, tolerated or, uh, or along the lines of that. So I think that's what I've learned is to, is to never give up that fight because then if I do, then, you know, nothing really changes. So I think I've stuck to my guns, I hope. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's what I've learned. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I think we've got a sort of theme coming out around education and around understanding how systems work, understanding the data and the stats, uh, to have more informed conversations. For people listening that want to learn more, um, Sasha, where, where do you find your stats? Are there any good sources you can recommend for people to, to look at? If I'm honest, uh, there's uh, so many different uh, resources that have come out of Instagram that I've seen, um, as well as if you actually, if you like, I always say this to people and I, and I don't mean this and I think people sometimes do take it in a uh, in a negative way because when you tell people to educate themselves it's already kind of an uncomfortable conversation but Google is free and I always say this to people like if you type something on Google you'll get a document you'll get a thesis you'll get you know the stats and that's that's what I've done I've you know typed in on Google um, you know how, how what percentage do black people get stopped and searched and you know a document comes up three times more likely to be stopped and searched um, as well as things that are on Instagram. I think people need to not only start diversifying and opening their mind, but they need to be actually, you know, expanding the people that they, that they watch, the people that they listen to and the people that... Oh, we've just lost Sasha briefly. Um, but just to pick up, it sounds like um, some really good advice there about actually being proactive and looking for the information. I guess coupled with that, um, being mindful of the sources of information and fact checking things, looking for more than one source of it so that you know that what you're finding um, is grounded in evidence. And I suppose the more research you do, the more likely you're to find things that sort of stick together and, and build up a, pic a comprehensive picture and those that stick out and feel like they're perhaps not so reliable. Um, but some really good advice there. Um, so we have our first opportunity to take questions from our um, virtual audience. So I'm going to hand over to Krishna, um, who will share some of those questions for our panelists. Hi again, everyone. I'm I'm the audience at the moment. Um, so uh, lots of questions from everyone, which is super exciting. Some fantastic questions. Um, I've kept some of the uh, questions about what we can do and how we can really um, act on on some of this information and saving that for a bit later. Um, and kept just a couple of questions about just understanding the movement more now um, for for the time being. And um, the first one comes from from a mentee. Um, what does what does 
all lives matter mean and how can we educate our families and our friends about this? Um, which I think is a really interesting question. Um, would anyone like to take that first? Lavinia? Lavinia, do you feel like jumping in on that one? I mean, if you I can, but over to you. Yeah, no, go, go for it, go for it. Um, it's actually one I've had to explain a lot. Lavinia, do jump in as well with your thoughts on this, but essentially people, again, can find this out for themselves if they read up about what Black Lives Matter means. But what it means is that black lives only matter when everyone, it's about black lives mattering as much as everyone else's life. That's what it's about. So it's about the brutality and the injustices of against black people until they stop and until there's a fair world for black people, then all lives don't matter. That's what it means, essentially, in, in my understanding of it. Lavinia, I don't know if you have further thoughts on that. I think you nailed it. Like, yeah, I think what we have with All Lives Matter, it's a quite a knee-jerk reaction to um, the statement Black Lives Matter. And it's not to take away from the fact that All Lives Matter, of course, yeah, 100% they do. But at this moment in time, Black Lives Matter, because we know that people, as Sasha said, are three times more likely to be stopped and searched, three times more likely to be excluded from school, um, less likely to be employed. The stats are there. So at this point, I think it's, it's about focusing on the, uh, yeah, on the, on the pot, I guess, drawing it to a positive face that black lives do matter and they should matter in society. So. Thank you so much, Sasha. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that at all. Oh, we're still on mute, Sasha. Sorry, sorry. there you go. I'm um, sorry, I didn't hear the, the full question. I think I'm having some Wi-Fi problems. <laughs> It was what what does all lives matter mean and how can we educate our our families about this as well um and and perhaps actually you can touch a bit more on how, how we can educate other people uh, about the issue sensitively and you know in in the way that that feels right yeah it's a very good question um i would say it's it's saying the, the statistics you know i think people can't argue with the stats. They can argue with opinion, but they can't argue with the facts that are, that are there. So I think in educating people, we have to be educated in ourselves and we have to be confident in how we present that. For example, um, you know, I have family that say all lives matter. I, my dad says, for example, all lives matter. And he, he is a black man. Um, and I think it goes back to, to re-educating people. Um, so what I didn't mention is, so I was born in Zimbabwe, so I'm Zimbabwean. And my dad has been, um, you know, born in Zimbabwe and he lives there. Um, and coming to the UK, you know, uh, looking back at my, I would say, looking back at my childhood experiences, I think you do see them in a different light when you grow older, because then you realize what the situations were when you were, you know, young. Um, and a lot of people would say, you can't speak English, or can you speak English? And I struggled a lot through school, um, because people thought I can't, I couldn't speak English, but if they really learned the history of Zimbabwe, it was colonized by the British. Everyone's, you know, majority of people there speak English. It's still taught in the schools. Um, and it just turns out that, you know, I'm dyslexic and I have a learning difficulty. And I only was diagnosed when I got to university because um, of everything that's happened. So I feel like we need to start educating people about realizing the stats and also realizing how society treats black people. Um, and I would say it's just having those honest conversations. And one of the things that recently my friends said, it's also having, because for me, I think I need to learn on this is when people debate with me and it's something that I know that's really wrong because my value is, I hate anything that's in like wrong, that's not just, um, and I really get angry about it. So what I need to learn is to let them feel like they're also being listened to. So you need to let them say what they're saying and even though it infuriates you inside let them feel like they're being listened to because that's when you can actually you know they would be open to having the conversation about learning um and you know like the other panelists said it's not necessarily that you know all lives don't matter because clearly everyone does and if that statement was true in itself black lives would be included in that statement but it's not so i think once people realize that then we can move forward with a you know positive conversation um and that statement won't be true and you know, until you realise that Black Lives Matter are included in that, then I guess your statement's false anyways. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, loads of questions coming in. So um, 
uh, a couple about the um, protests that I, I will come back to later. Um, how can we address the low numbers of black female people in places of power to make a change? Sasha, do you want to start on that? Yeah, I can start. In terms of, I would say, starting as, say, if, you, if you're going to university or if you're still at school, still go for the high positions that you, you're able to go for. So, uh, for example, when I was in school, I ran for head girl. I didn't get it, but I still went for the position. Um, and then when I was at university, I ran for vice president in the leadership elections. And I think people need to push themselves forward and, and go for these positions because you're, everyone has, you know, the same, the same ability to do things. So I think people need to believe in themselves and push themselves forward. Um, and I know it comes kind of in like two halves because on one half, you know, there's some black people out there that just want to live their life. Like they don't want to be, you know, a spearhead of change or something. They just want to live their life. And then there's other people who do want these roles. Um, so for the people who do want, you know, to have these roles and go for them, I would say put yourself in, in that, you know, the white space for me. Um, and I think a lot of students unions, as well as universities, the senior leaders are very white. So there's no diversity in probably any its form. And I would say the only diversity that they have is they really call onto the diversity of gender. So they're like, we have diversity. We have one woman and 500 men. <laughs> um, so I think going for these positions and it will be uncomfortable, but I think once you start working, once you pave the way, other people will follow. And I think that's what's important. We need to build momentum about pushing people to go for leadership positions, as well as believing that you can. And it is hard because once you do get there, you do have so much pushback, not only from, you know, the people who don't want you in that position. For example, you know, I've received hate mail in my position um, and I still keep going. So I feel like we need to like really be supported by our role as well and by the job because if you're not supported in the role um then there's so many people that are just waiting for you to fail so i think not only do people need to get into these roles but the organizations themselves need to learn how to support black people in taking up these roles because they haven't been given the same opportunities as other people thank you um lavinia yeah so i i absolutely agree i think there's um something important um, across different sectors about having a policy um, that reflects um, the importance of having black women specifically and women in positions of leadership. Um, and I think with, with that approach, it basically, it sends a message um, across that, you know, women, having women on that front is really important. But also I think like it does kind of break down the lack of access to that as well because if you're not if you're not seeing yourself um as reflected within those roles because you're not number one being encouraged to apply you're um also not you know aware of the kind of like policies that are needed to um i guess implement that the, the recruitment process it's just not going to happen i mean you can be as like ready for the role you can be as like confident as you can but if that policy is there that basically like it won't overtly say that we don't employ black women, but if there is no leadership on that level that is thinking about how do we actively and um, intentionally make this a process that is welcoming for applicants um, of, of a black background, of um, who are women as well, it's not gonna happen. So I also think that like policy is really important. Um, but secondly, um, having, having an audit, because currently, as we know, there are some um, organizations that are just so oblivious to the fact that like it's a problem and there needs to be like an, an audit in how many numbers um, and making sure that like all of these things is tied to pay so um, for example if um, there are no um, say black women in like a senior leadership role you know what why why is that what are the numbers how many are in junior levels um, and is there any kind of like metrics that we can use to ensure that they get to the next level um, so I think it's really important that um, yeah like a, an approach from top down is done um, so that yeah, these, these changes can be made. Thank you so much, Lavinia. Um, and Mo, I guess this is a, a lot of what you're doing as well. With yes, all this moment. is what I'm working on. So um, firstly, from my own experience, having worked in the technical kind of companies, for example, I worked at one tech corporation where there were 4,000 people, 20% were women, 
and were mostly in kind of the lower level roles. In the senior leadership team that I progressed to, there were about 100 people and around 10 women. And in terms of people of colour, very few. There, I can only think of maybe two. And so, and that's just one example of so many organisations around the country. And I don't just mean companies. That is reflected everywhere. And those things have to change. So there are, um, there have been government sponsored reports that show that more diverse organisations have better ideas, more innovation, make more profits. There are targets set which are not met, they're going to be missed. There's one for next year to have um, a director of colour on um, boards of companies by 2021. It's going to be missed by the majority of companies. So there are targets, there's been, there's been studies, there's been reports, they haven't resulted in the change. I think as Lavinia was saying, there needs to be specific targets around this. And it's not just about people that join companies or organisations as well, because I think they need to look at when someone joins, how long do they stay? Because actually the experience for a lot of people is so hard that they don't stay very long and they go and do something else. So there's so much work to do around this area. And it's only by people putting themselves forward, as Sasha said, to be in those roles that things are going to change. But it's not just that. There needs to be structural support for this, for this to actually happen. Because there, this is a moment where if these things aren't put in place now, that it won't change. So there is momentum around it now and it has to happen now. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for all of your questions. Um, I'll definitely come back to uh, as many of them as possible after, but I'll let Charlie carry on with a couple of, uh, a couple of questions that she had as well and I'll come back to that. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, I'm sure if there are questions we don't get to in this session, we can share them with panellists and put up a blog with some more answers for you so that you still get your questions answered too. Um, but thank you for all those questions. Really brilliant um, thoughts and, and, and um, uh, things to explore with our panellists. Um, we wanted now to focus a bit more on, on how we can all get involved in the Black Lives Matter movement um, and how we can make a positive impact on the future. Um, so next question for the panellists, Lavinia, I'll come to you first. Um, what do you envisage for the Black Lives Matter movement in the future and what direction do we as a country need to head? I think it needs to be embedded throughout every single kind of sector of society so that it's not just like a movement. I think the reference to it as a movement is great, but it almost kind of like, um, it, 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 yeah, it, I guess it individualizes the issue and makes it about, um, the, I guess, the, the organization of people's protesting rather than the facts of the matter, which is Black Lives Matter in, um, in institutions, in science, in education. And I think like if we take an approach where we understand that Black Lives Matter, as I said earlier, in life, not just death, um, that's, I, I, I think that's where changes will start to be made and we won't see as much statistics that are reflecting the disproportionality of, of racism. Um, I also do think that um, on a more micro level, it, it happens in the household, it happens in your interactions with black people. I think sometimes um, it's really important that, um, or rather I think it's sometimes what we see is that people are unaware of how, um, of how I guess like certain ideas and like stereotypes are often played out in our interactions. And I think like if we were to really just analyze um, how racism manifests in, in its very basic form through microaggressions, you know, like, you know, maybe touching someone's, touching a black person's hair, even when they haven't asked you to do so, asking, can you swim? You know, just really, really redundant questions. I think like just analyzing how those things operate on a very micro level um, reinstates the importance of black lives um, because, you know, those stereotypes give way to police killings. It gives way to, the mistreatment of black people in the workplace and so forth. So I think if we can start to break down in our in our lives, like the ways in which people think about black people and also the ways in which we interact with black people, that's also, a, a, I guess, a practical step. Because um, it's easy to say, oh, you know, change needs to be happening in the police and this and that. But I think on a very basic level, these are the things that we can do. Thank you, Livinia. I think it's really good to have those practical examples of things we can be doing as well, because I think um, your point about taking it from being a movement to actually embedded in the way we think is really, really key. But that's a very big ambition. And, and some of those smaller practicalities might be the, the building blocks to get there because um, it's such a complex challenge as well. Um, Mo, what are your reflections? Um, so 
I have a concern, which I think I said earlier on, that this will die down, and I'm really worried about that happening. This can't be, as Lorraine said, it can't be a movement, it can't be a hashtag, it can't be black squares on Instagram. This is bigger yeah. than that, and I'm worried about that because our society has a tendency to move on from things to the next thing. So I'm very concerned about that. Um, to keep this conversation going and to make the changes, it has to stop being a movement, it has to be this is what we need to do as society. We, you know, we want a kinder, fairer society and there has to be change. Um, they, what people can do is continue their learning around this, continue with all those things they're doing and actually challenge people. That's a hard thing to do, but if you see things happening that you know aren't right, this is not the time to be quiet. This is the time to challenge those things and say, and, and actually speak back to people about them. So there are, there's different levels of things people can do. There's those kinds of levels. There's educating yourself. There's keeping the conversations going. There's, I mean, people I work with are doing things like um, when they see conferences announced and all of the panelists are white men, they're challenging that. Somebody messaged me the other day and said, could I speak on a panel? Because all of the panelists they had lined up were white men. It's only by people doing those things, systematically challenging everything, that things are going to change. I'm doing a lot of work with the council where I live, Brighton Council. So Brighton Council is totally unrepresentative. I think there's one person of colour who's a councillor and that's it. Um, and the population is actually more diverse than that. So it's like I'm, I'm working with them on how they can encourage more people to stand as counsellors, for example, because it's only by people doing those things that you make changes happen. So I would also say to mentees who are on the, on the call to think about what careers you want to do and how, what changes you feel you can, you're going to make in society in those roles that you take, because it's kind of down to all of us to keep this going and make that change happen. Thanks, May. I think that's a really good point about us taking personal responsibility um, to stop to, to make sure it continues. Um, Sasha, in just in a minute, I'll come to you, but I'm conscious Lavinia is going to have to leave us. So, Lavinia, just I just want to give you a moment. If there are any lasting thoughts you want to leave us with, um, and also if you want to let people know about how they can get involved with the Black Curriculum, if there's anything you want people to do, um, or where they can find out more about it. Yeah. Um thank you for this opportunity it's been really great hearing um from yourself Mo and Sasha um I'd say my lasting words is to always just trust the process and um really just understand that if you plan um and you ha actually have these conversations with people um and set kind of like intentions for how you want to be in like five years six years three years even if it's just like a year just making sure you have that intention that it will happen but you just have to continue to just like keep planning and connect with the right people um because that's definitely helped me and like um yeah like my mentor who is was my mentor is still very involved in my life from the girls network so i think just surrounding yourself with the right people is really key in this um and if you want to know more about the black curriculum we're on instagram the black curriculum um twitter is curriculum black and our website is w.theblackcurriculum.com and you can find out how to get involved you can share some of our work you've got animations and like free black history resources so you can share with your families and stuff as well but um yeah thank you Great, thank you so much, Lavinia, um, and I'm sure we'll hear lots more from you over time. But well done on the amazing what you're doing. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye, Charlie. Lovely to see you. Bye. Um, so, Sasha, I want to come then to you on that question about um, the future of Black Lives Matter. Um, that is currently talked about as a movement, but as we've discussed, you know, thinking about it more broadly, like what is the future, and what are your thoughts on how we make sure this is a lasting movement and and that it's, it. Um, that continues into the future? I think, like what the other panelists said, I think it's quite important because right now, I think people are jumping on the trend. Organizations are now starting to scuffle and say, realize that they only have one black person in a whole organization of 4,000, uh, like Mo said, or something like that. <laughs> um, so I think it's not about a trend. Like, black people's lives are not a trend. And black squares, like I said to many people, do nothing for black people. Um, and I think it's about education. It's about educating yourself about the British Empire, um, educating yourself about how, um, you know, what impacts one person in America will affect us all around the world directly or indirectly. Um, so I think it's about education i think that's where we need to start because if we look at our, our history um, that's taught in for example schools there's no mention of uh you know how the british empire were oppressors it's always seen as the british empire were the saviors from you know the savages um, and i think we need to start changing the narrative of black people because when if they're forever seen as 
as you know um as a crim criminal then they're going to be perceived as that throughout history and it won't just stop here it will go on for many more years to come so i think for one it's about realizing that black lives literally are not a trend um and i think like uh, like what lavinia said is black people matter when they're alive and not only when they're dead and people are mourning the loss of the life that they had and i think that's a very important point to to be made because if we don't celebrate them when they're when they're alive and you only want to celebrate when celebrate them when they die that is so backwards because the whole point of you know i know we say it's not a movement but the whole point of the the black lives um, matter movement is about making sure black people stay alive long enough to live their life um so i think education is very important educate yourselves educate your family and i think it's about a we need to keep having these uncomfortable conversations with our families because for generations and generations, you know, racism is taught. You're not born being racist. No one knows, you know, when you're born, you don't know what black or white is, but it's taught. It's taught in our education systems. You know, you get it from institutions, the NHS, the police. So I think it's about having policies and having a, a you know, a plan forward because we can't just rely on people, you know, in their individual selves anymore. It needs to be a whole organizational change. And that's also in the government. Um, and like I say, with a lot of people is people protect statues more than they protect black lives. And I think when we really get into that, I think we need to understand that people are protecting bricks more than they are actually protecting lives that actually exists in our day now and I think once you really dig deep into what what people's actions are then we start to you know try to understand and solve problems where they they are lacking you know the kind of understanding of the history of the British Empire so I think education is going to be the thing that really pushes this this thing not only in its movement form in terms of getting people out on the streets but I think in terms of changing organization structures um, and I think I know we, we might touch on the protests um, in a little while but what I wanted to say with that is given that black people are four times more likely to die of coronavirus yet they're still on the streets today i think it shows that they are risking their lives because if they don't risk their lives now then you know their lives will be taken away from them regardless of what they do whether they survive coronavirus or you know this um uh, the environmental crisis they will still be at the bottom of everything else so i think it's it's about just saving lives and, and i think that's really important Thank you, Sasha. I think I'm hearing some some lots of big themes coming out today around the importance of educating ourselves, of listening, of having conversations, difficult conversations, uncomfortable conversations, the importance of systems and structures and things changing from a policy level, both governmental, but also in business as well, but also the importance of the individual action within the collective. What can you commit to? What conversations can you have? Um, so we're going to open up again in a minute to other questions from our audience. But just before I do, I'd love to hear from each of you um, one or two really specific things that the people, particularly young people, but anybody in this session could do now to get involved to make a positive difference. Um, I don't mind who starts. No, you can start, it's fine. <laughs> So we've all, we've talked about some of this already about it, the importance of educating yourself. So I think there's some, something tangible everybody can do to learn more, um, and everyone has interest in different things. So it could be that reading a book of fiction is the thing that will help you understand more. It could be that reading factual books is going to help you more. I've been reading lots recently. Um, actually, I wrote a blog about them, which I'll pin to the top of my Twitter profile because it might help with some references on it. But you know, there are some great books like Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race by Renny Ada Lodge, uh, British by Afua Hirsch. There's some really great books to read to help educate yourself. Books aren't for everyone though. So it might be that actually watching a documentary is the thing that's gonna help you understand it. And there's so many different aspects to this as well. Um, I watch, for example, Sitting in Limbo, which is about um, somebody from the Windrush generation. Absolutely fascinating, really recommend it to people. It could be that it's music, it could be that it's someone on Instagram you need to follow who's gonna help. There's a, a great Instagram page called The Other Box, if you don't know it, they, they have some um, really good resources and things there. Um, I think it's I think there isn't an excuse for people to say they can't find out the information. I think it's time to for everybody to, to play their part and actually learn what we're talking about. Um, there will be 
work done to change curriculums in schools for example so as Sasha was saying when I was at school I was really frustrated because we learned about the Tudors and the Stuarts and then we went to kind of Nazi Germany and Bolshevik Russia and we missed out the Bengal famine and partition and all those things that I knew about but it was just completely missed so I think yeah I think my biggest thing to say is to everybody there is some way for you to access something that you'll be able to understand whether it's a film or music blogs or you know whatever it is just take the time to do that thank yeah. you mo um we'll make sure as well that we um share with you the blog and the things that mo's mentioned so that you can access those um sasha did you want to add yeah um so i'll start off first with um just i would say the black women that are in the um in the forum today i don't know what you'd call it zoom call um is to take a rest i would say first of all take a rest it has been exhausting for myself um just in the last month trying to explain to people why my ma my life matters or my family's life matters so i would first say take a break re-energize and also pick pick your battles as in like your energy is is valuable so pick where you want to invest that energy in um, and also i would say to um, everyone else is to be an active ally i think there's a difference between being an ally and, and you know saying black lives matter hashtag and actually you know meaning it signing the petitions um you know raising uh, black people's voices in in businesses in, in group projects and it, it could be the smallest things ever um, even for example when someone touches a black person's hair you can say for example you shouldn't be touching their hair without their permission because you know they're not they're not an object they're not your property and it's these little things that really change the way society functions around black people so i think um you know take some time rest as well and be an active ally and still you know educate yourself i think education is a key point that i want to make because what i've learned as well is that um, in 2015 you know the the uk government um ended their payments uh, for people who lost out on slavery of like freeing people of the slaves and that was five years ago that's not like 1992 or something like that it was five years ago that's in my lifetime and i'm only 23. um so i think you know education is very important so even if you're black like myself i'm still learning about things about my history because no one's taught it to me uh, um, and no one will tell it to you until you force them to start having these conversations. Thank you, Sasha. And that's helpful as well. I'm reflecting on, you know, actually, perhaps I should take some time and, and think more about what are the things I'm doing that are not helping or what are, the, what are the ways in which I'm not being an active ally and maybe committing to a couple of things I can proactively start to do would be a good starting point. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I had a really a good just a point on what you said one of my i was talking to one of my friends and uh she was basically apologizing for being a horrible ally and what she said to me was really quite powerful because she said to me i care about the environment i reuse my bag i buy metal straws um and i do the best that i can to you know reduce reduce my waste and she was like but when I look at equality and diversity, I say that I'm an ally, but what do I have to show for that? Like what actions can I actually say, this is what I'm doing to, to be a part of this, this, this movement and to help people who don't benefit from the, the privileges that I get. And it just made me think because, you know, it makes people think about what actions do they have to show? Not that they need to show them, but for yourself, if you think that you're an ally, think about how, what where 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 are your actions because i think that's where it comes down to you know it's it's not good enough to you know go home and say you know to your family or to yourself i care about um the world i care about black people it's what actions have you taken so i think that's really important thank you sasha um so we're going to move back to questions from the room um so i'll hand back to krishna um to share your questions with our panelists Hi everyone, um, I know we're also coming to near 5.30. Uh, Mo and Sasha have kindly offered to stay on the call uh, for a little longer after that as well. Um, so we do have quite a few questions. Um, do feel free to, to sign off if and when you need to, um, but we'll keep going with, with some questions for, for a little bit. Um, so starting off on, on one related to social media, um, how, how do we manage it? There's so much content on there uh, and some of it can be quite hard to absorb. Uh, and that really relates to me trying to read Twitter comments, which are horrifying sometimes. Um, what tips do you have to have a healthy relationship with social media? 
on on matters like this um should i start sasha yeah, yeah so um social media i love i love it and hate it <laughs> um it, it's a it can be a difficult place to be so i think it depends on your perspective and on your life i would say if it's if you're finding it difficult give yourself a break from it because it there are times where you need to do that there are times where i've had to just switch it all off because it can be exhausting um there are different techniques to manage your social media so you can have it under a different name for example that sometimes helps you can mute people you can block people all of those things i think probably um it's thinking about how you want to engage in social media so me personally i don't get involved in debate and backwards and forwards with people i don't think you're ever going to educate somebody just on social media and i don't think i'm going to defend myself very well on social media either i think it's just going to lead to anxiety so i don't do that um, but some people do and I think it's about choosing what you want to do in terms of the different social media platforms Personally, I find Instagram's kinder because it's you know kind of more Photos and things like that Twitter can be quite a harsh place to be it can be really interesting too if you follow there are some really interesting people to follow who post some really great stuff and really interesting debate so I think it's just about I think really with social media, I guess the biggest thing I'd say is self-care is, you know, you don't have to be on it. You don't have to be on it all the time. And the, the most important thing is you, how you feel about being on it and how you feel about the space. Yeah, I would agree. I would say for myself, I would say I'm always on social media. Um, I'm always posting videos. Um, and most recently, I literally just had a breakdown. I was like, I just had enough. So I literally went on the like, I think it was a social, it was just a block of everything. And I turned off my phone and I said, you know, I said to my friends, just, just leave me be like for, you know, some time until I'm ready to come back to society online. And they respected that. So I think it's about telling people your boundaries. So when you need a break, you need to tell people, obviously for the, for the, for them not to worry, tell them, you know, I'm going on a break. I'm fine. I just need some time to clear my head. Um, and like what Mo said, is picking picking your battles. For me, I think reserving your energy for the things that you really want to fight is probably the best way. Because if that if I did it in the other way, I would be fighting people all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I I comment on everything. I that's just the type of person that I am. If I see something I don't like, I'll comment on it. Whether people reply to that, I can choose whether I want to reply back. And a good example is I saw this this photo and I think the it was either the Guardian or some newspaper posted it and it was a cartoon um, picture of um, Meghan Markle and Harry and it was and it was racist and I said in you know in the comments and I was like you know dear Guardian <laughs> um, this is racist do better and then you know someone from Canada because you know I created their account was like how is this racist and I was like. I'm not going to reply to you. <laughs> so have a good day. So I just did it. And you know, they're probably still waiting. Well, I probably doubt it. But I picked my battle. And I think different social media has different different types of presence. And especially during this time, it can be quite consuming. Because you know, the sad thing about this whole, you know, movement is that unless it's recorded, that's when justice gets and obviously, the recordings can be quite brutal to watch online. And that I think for me, that's also something that um, impacts my mental health is this continuous just thing of seeing black people dying on, on camera and um, that really impacts my mental health so I think if you're if you are for example say an ally um, wanting to maybe ask questions about black lives matter just make sure that the the videos are not triggering in any ways and if they are then mention that um, and then if you do want to just generally take a break I would say definitely take a break like social media is not going anywhere and it's fine like your mental health is so important so literally just take a break <laughs> Thank you, Sasha. We're conscious that it is about to hit half past five and we want to formally end on time so that those of you that need to leave can do. Um, as Christian says, we will still have some more time for questions for anyone that wants to stick around um, and we'll make sure that everything that's been talked about is shared with you afterwards as well so you can look up the different blogs and recommendation, uh, recommendations for reading and podcasts and so on as well. Um, but I just want to take this opportunity to formally thank our panellists Mo, Sasha and Lavinia um, for your time and for your openness um, and willingness to share your experiences and thoughts. I know that I've found it hugely educating um, and I'm going to go away and do lots more reading and reflecting. Um, 
thank you everybody for joining us. We would really encourage you to spend some time reflecting on what you've learned from this, what you've taken away, and think about sharing that with maybe three other people. How can you amplify your learning and your understanding to start um, embedding that a bit more in the people around you so that this doesn't um, become a flash in the pan movement, but really changes the way that we um, think, live and act. Um, so thank you very much once again. Um, as Christian said, um, if you want to stay on the line, please do, um, and there'll be an opportunity to um, answer some more of your questions. But if not, have a lovely rest of your day, and it's been great to have you with us. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so lots and lots of questions here. Um, I will get through as many as as many as possible uh, now. So. Um, one thing that um, I know I know you've both touched on um, in, in different ways, um, but a, a couple of questions came through around other than signing petitions, um, what can I do if I don't have money to donate funds? Um, what, what are the other ideas um, that you both have um, for, for girls and our mentors to, to get more involved um, in addition to kind of self-educating, etc.? Do you want me to go first on this one? Yeah. Um, I guess what Charlie said as well um, is more about like man, for me money is not everything like and obviously when it comes to um, different types of people especially people from socio you know socioeconomic backgrounds um, it really depends whether they have the funds and if you have the funds then by all means you know give to to projects that for example bail out um, protesters um, in, in these charity organizations um, but if you don't have the funds, then that's fine. Like, don't feel like you're not, you know, creating change because you, you know, you don't have the, the money for it because that's, that's not really what change is about. It's not about money. It's not about wealth. It's about education. And, and like I said before, Google's free. Like, if you feel like you can't donate to, to something, um, read what that, what that is, share it with your family, share it with your friends. Um, and what I've said, for example, because recently I'm actually fundraising to um, give to save the children for the Yemen crisis. And I say to my friends, if you can't, if you can't, you know, afford to donate, that's fine. Just spread awareness, share it. So, you know, along the lines, you know, your friend will share it, your friend of a friend will share it. And someone along the lines will be able to support that financially. But in terms of educating yourself, Google's free. Um, learn and then also you know pass it on to three other people because that still is the change it's, it's like keeping the momentum off just talking about things that are very important and if you can get out, on the, get out on the streets and you're not a vulnerable person and you would want to do that then that's also some way that you can contribute to you know the movement as well as um, spreading awareness thank you Sasha and, and Mo what what might you recommend in terms of things to do yeah, so um, echoing everything Sasha said, and also in terms of petitions, um, what I found really useful with petitions is to look up the petitions actually um, pushed by the Black Lives Matter movement and do your research because there are there is a, there's petitions for everything, and actually it's about supporting the ones that are really driving the change and and really doing your research. And as Sasha said, Google's free; you can find out which petitions are the ones to back and petitions do make they do make things change but they need that backing so um, if you do your research and find out the right ones to back and then share it all of that's free share that with people and that will start to amplify the message and though you know those things do drive change the, the government they do as much as they might not want to admit that if a petition gets like a million signatures something does happen yeah, just, just to add on that as well, um, because I know, for example, I have family friends that are um, have, for example, mobility, um, you know, problems with um, with themselves um, and they can't, you know, physically go out and campaign. And I was having a conversation about them just in general about um, what's happening around the world. And they felt quite, you know, sad that they couldn't contribute in, for example, a physical presence. Um, but what I said to her was like, social media is so powerful, like mm. spreading that awareness and getting that momentum is so, so powerful. Um, and if you think about how we even got here in the first place is putting pressure on governments to do something important. Um, and for example, Breonna Taylor's, um, I would say murderers are still not arrested. Mm. So, you know, spreading that awareness and, and retweeting and posting and sharing and signing petitions and also signing petitions that make change because I know for example there's um, some information going around saying that change.org doesn't necessarily have any you know parliamentary backing for example so it's also finding out which petitions go where and how that voice is heard along the lines if that makes sense. 
just one point on that. So um, the government petitions are the ones that are there from the government site. But because I've been doing some local campaigning in Brighton where I live, I've recently found out that they will accept change to all petitions. So again, it's doing your research, finding out who the petitions targeted at and what actually is going to work. Thank you both. Um, that's a really helpful point. And, and Sasha, um, your message around your, your family member who wasn't able to attend um, attend the, the protests or, uh, or anything, that's, I believe, um, come up a few times in the chat, actually, some of the girls and mentors say, saying that they feel guilty about not being able to go because of, of being vulnerable, and that's really helpful advice. Thank you. Um, so one question, which I, I really like, what's your opinion on Gen Z on selling out a Trump rally? I, think I don't know if you heard about heard about this, but um, yeah. I believe it was something that went around on on TikTok asking yeah. um, asking. Oh yes, I did hear about that. Yeah, to sign up to the Trump yeah. rally, and I think and they were it was like yeah lots of empty seats yes i did read about that i i mean i love that story personally i thought that showed the power of what people can do actually showed the power of social media and how these things can happen and i think that's been the thing about the protests as well so where i live for example there um there's been two groups running the protests one group run they call it the safe and silent protest which is on the beach on madeira drive and then the other group that do the ones that go that are actually to a rally and they've been really effective at getting the message out and the social media on those and you've seen that there's been lot, tons and tons of young people involved and I think it's brilliant when you see those things happening. Yeah I, I love it. I think seeing a sad Trump is definitely something that I will keep in my mind forever <laughs> but um, in terms of Gen Z I think I'm really impressed and I think just a couple of years ago I remember people saying you know oh because I'm 1997 so I'm either depending on where where you read it i'm either gen z or just ending the millennial and um, i used to be oh yes i'm a millennial blah, blah, blah. and now i'm like i'm a gen z like i'm so proud of it but i know that i'm right at the right at the top and i was talking to my friends about it and um we were kind of celebrating but also said that we as you know the i would say right at the beginning of gen z and of kind of the cutoff of millennials this is our chance to to fight really hard for the change that we want to see so the gen the gen z that are like my niece's age that are like six four can really benefit from the change that we have now so i'm, I'm really proud of that and it just shows and like i said what you know what the instagram and and social media can really do Thank you both. Um, that uh, story of the Trump rally is definitely one of my favourites uh, mm -hmm. of recent times too. Um, so another another question: What does the UK need to do most urgently as a country? Um, a lot of a lot of issues being talked about right now are US centric, um, and there's the, but there are also big problems here too. Um, what do you think are the most pressing issues um, that are specific to the UK at the moment? Mm, I think it's a hard one. Yeah, I think, huge question. yeah it, I think it's a huge, first I would say they first need to identify that the problem is here as well, because a lot of people say, for example, why are you marching for George Floyd in the UK? Mm. And I'm like, you know, you know, the, U, the US didn't learn racism from itself, like it started with the British Empire and people don't know that. So I think people first need to start actually you know, identifying the problem as a country and saying, for example, because, you know, Boris Johnson will protect, you know, what's his name? <laughs> Winston Churchill more than he will literally say Black Lives Matter in mm. all its forms. And the fact that he's said multiple racist comments, not only to black people, but to Muslim women, um, is, is just unbecoming of our whole, the, the, all the values that we stand for as a country. And I think they need to start identifying that racism exists. And I know we've had the whole year where, you know, Meghan Markle has literally been dragged through the media and i think once we identify that the media has a bias and that we need to stop changing the way that we view politics and everything else uh, i don't even know where to start first i think we've got to start in the government and the media um, and that's really important because I was, I was watching another story um and it was from america but what what she was saying was people are judging what's happening through social media through you know the media platforms of the news and that's the difference where the older generation are watching the news but the younger generation are on the streets and that's what they do they have the experience from their lived experiences but for example some of the older generation have their you know i would say tainted in a, in a sense view of what the world is perceiving the matter as because it's 
it's through the media that doesn't have it has it has its own agenda so i think there's a, there's a lot of things to unpick first i don't actually know where to start i would say first acknowledging that the problem exists in the uk and the uk yeah. is not innocent I'd agree with that. Um, it's, it's a huge question. It's a great question. Um, and I probably have seen things from a slightly different perspective in terms of people at work and kind of older generation people I know who who don't understand this and don't understand what the problem is and don't understand what we're talking about and why is you know why are these things happening. So I think there needs to be um, acknowledgement and acceptance from all around the country. That's probably the first step because there are, I, yeah, I mean, I don't want to go too much into negative stuff, but I've seen some people um, really kind of questioning what's going on and why are we doing this and what's going on, you know, everything's fine. It's like, it's not. <laughs> so, so I think there's a, there's a huge um, first step in the, for the whole country to acknowledge the problem and that we need to do something about it. That's really helpful. Thank you both. I think that's something that um, that I definitely need to go and do some more research on as well myself. Um, what, I'll take a, a couple more questions if you're both um, yeah. able to spend some time. Um, so how do we spot and challenge cultural appropriation? Um, and I wonder if it might be helpful for uh, if, if either of you could define cultural appropriation for us as well as a, as a good starting point. Yeah, sure. Do you want me to go? Yeah, go ahead, Sasha. I think I think this one's really good because I was actually recently watching um, a Netflix series called The Politician, and they actually did a little um, episode that was on a cultural appropriation, um, and the people were basically explaining why it's wrong and and why, for example, the difference between appreciation and appropriation. And I think what people lack the knowledge of is that that line is very thin like it's so thin you could possibly see through it um but i think people need to educate themselves of why um why different you know different people have different cultures and what it means to different groups um for example um braids and cane rows what people don't understand that when people were um in the slave trade people had to braid you know rice into their hair to survive and people don't people don't understand that and even till this day um, black women um, and black men in the workplace are judged by by the way that they wear their hair, by the way that they looked and seen and perceived by society. So when you know a white person, for example, um, takes that on as a trend and because it just looks cool, but don't realize the you know the the history behind it, and they are you know more how would I say they're accepted by society. There's, there's something wrong there because for one, that's not even your culture um, and the people who actually have that culture are being judged differently by it. So the definition itself, I would say it's about misusing and mistreating um, others' cultures without the knowledge of, of what it actually means for your personal gain. Um, and we see a lot about, you know, I hate to bring them up, but the Kardashians do it a lot um, to, to make money. And it's, it's about capitalizing on black black and also you know people of colors um cultures and pain for profit that's the way that i see it yeah great description i, I was going to use another book example to help me but um the, yeah it was a great description by sasha there um but there's another book um which i really recommend to people it's called the good immigrant by nikesh shukla and it's several essays and the opening essay actually is a good example of it it's um i think the title of it is actually namaste and it's about the use of the word namaste and yoga and how these things have become appropriated and for example if i were to go to a yoga studio near me there would be no coloured faces, I don't think, but there'll be room, the room full of people chanting namaste and saying those words without reference to what they actually mean and where that's actually come from. So that's probably the best example I could give of that. And I really recommend that book as well. Oh, that book does sound good. I have a, a real experience that, um, that we had. So last year in my role as vice president, um, one of the clubs in town actually opened, they like re did a re revamp or rebrand and they opened as Tokyo Tea Rooms um, and in their opening they had, um, you know, white women dressed as geishas um, and obviously if anyone really does, you know, the research into what geishas are or even what a tea room is, it is not a club, so that's the big hint. Um, and we called them out and one of um, the vice presidents, um, Omolade, definitely called them out and 
overnight it was national national news and that's why we got death threats because we called someone out for appropriating culture for for money um and i think people need to understand the the history behind people's cultures before they start capitalizing on them because i think that's wrong thank you both um i really like the i don't, I don't think i'd heard the um appreci appreciation and appropriation uh, put together before that's a really helpful uh, that was a really great definition actually sasha thank you <laughs> Um, correct. <laughs> and I'll, I'll go for a, a last question uh, now, unless unless anyone pops anything in the chat box that's a, a quick question, a quick final question. Um, how can women best use their network um, and other other women and girls around them uh, to stay energized and, and to keep this fight going in the long term? No, you can, you can start. I'll start. Yeah. OK, so. Um, uh, the networks are kind of going to be the most important things in driving this forward and they're so important um, and that's why I mean that's the girls network is a fantastic charity for that reason and it's why I enjoy working with the girls network and, uh, and most mentors will tell you they stay in touch with their mentees and you know it goes on and Sasha you know you're a great example you, you be a, you're a mentee and then you progress so the, the network is really important and a kind of vital way for driving change um, and another book I've been reading I'm gonna people are gonna think all I do is read books but it's called Difficult Women by Helen Lewis and it's about the fact that it's not the quiet kind of um, passive type of voice that drives change it's actually being difficult that's what drives change and being difficult is quite hard and you need your network around you you need your support to do that to drive those things and to keep going because it's hard work and so it's really important for people to maintain all of their networks and um, I have great hopes for the next generation I think that um, all of um, the young people you see um, live life differently and want change and are driving change. Um, and that's going to happen through the connection of all the networks. Yeah, I would I would agree with everything that, that Mo has said. I would say networks are so important, not only in terms of just opportunity wise, because this is it gives you the chance to, um, you know, you know, a friend or, you know, someone that wants that same opportunity, then, you, you know, you you give them that access to to your network. Um, so I think in terms of gaining and giving people their opportunities, I think that's that's one side of it. But in terms of what, what Mo said about being challenging, I think that's very important to have people who are able to support you. Um, and I can give examples of, of me working in, in the environment that I did work. Um, I was called aggressive multiple times. I was called one, one dimensional because all I talked about was race. And, you know, there was these this countless of criticisms and feedback that I got for just fighting for equality. Um, and at times I felt like I was the only person in the room that wanted, you know, justice for, for people of color. Um, and it was really diff difficult because I felt like at times I was being difficult, like not difficult in the sense of just, you know, fighting for change, but I was being unnecessary and difficult. And that you should never feel like that. So when you challenging people, keep challenging them if it's the right thing and just don't back down to or don't even don't mold yourself to be a socially accepted by people who don't respect you in the first place just keep pushing and and i think yeah have your network because that's really important and support systems definitely very important thank you um it's hard to be a challenger and a, and a disruptor definitely but it, um as you said really important to persist in, in those scenarios. Well, we appreciate you both as a mentor and ambassador and hopefully one day soon to be mentor again, Sasha. Also, yeah. um, thank you so, so much for joining us. And thank you girls and mentors who've, who've joined us um, during this call today. Um, as Charlie mentioned before, please do use this opportunity to um, and challenge yourself to um, share something new you've learned with, with three other people. Um, over the coming weeks and and to start having a think about uh, about everything that Mo, Sasha and Lavinia have shared with us. Um, so do sign off uh, as soon as you're um, ready and have a lovely evening everybody. Thank you so much. We'll share um, uh, an email with with just all the resources that um, that our team have, have put together and that Mo and Sasha and Lavinia have shared today. Um, so we'll be in touch soon. Thank you all. See you later. Bye. Bye bye. I will end the call so it's gonna it's gonna drop off for everybody. Nice to see you all. Bye. <laughs>